Let's get this started right. Let's make some noise for him. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. But Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, oh I'm alive. This is my testimony, from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony.
But somehow you want me, oh how you love me Somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life In the way it should go Father, it boggles our mind today to, to just think that the almighty, eternal God really wants us, and you really love us, that you would even have time to pay attention to us. God, thank you for sending your son to open the door so that we could belong to you. Today we praise you how great you are and how thankful we are that you love us enough to bring him into this world to die for us. And so as we worship you today, God, accept the praise and the thanksgiving from our heart. We praise you with all we got. And we pray now that you will Bring your word to us, God. Bless your word today. And help us to have an open heart that we might let you be in control. We really know that's the best thing for us. You in control. So we trust you now. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jesus. 
to a holy God this morning to sing to him. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty All thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky Guess what? It's time for you to go have some fun in children's church. The rest of you figured out what you're supposed to do. Sixteen thousand people crowded into Arrowhead Stadium a couple of weeks ago. Wait, they didn't crowd. This is 2020. We're not crowding into places. We're definitely at least six feet apart. But if you had a chance to watch the Chiefs defeat the Texans, you probably saw that there were sixteen thousand people spread throughout the stadium, and. They're spread out in a 76,416 seat stadium. So aside from COVID, we would call that an empty stadium. But if you put them in the right context, 16,000 people is a lot. In this room, we've probably got somewhere around 100, maybe 125. And then this is what a crowd of 10,000 looks like and then a crowd of 20,000. So somewhere between these two pictures, you've got 16,000 people. And I want you to imagine that there's not even a center space here, so they are tight together. And that's where we're gonna pick up in the Bible this morning. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, turn with me to Mark chapter eight. 
And while you're turning there, I want to welcome you, especially if you're a guest with us. We are so glad that you've chosen to be here this morning. I want to welcome those of you joining us at another campus, online, and through podcasts. We hope to be able to see you soon in person. Jeff and Jennifer are traveling this week and enjoying some well-earned rest and relaxation. So be praying for them that they really do rest, they really do relax while they're traveling. Now let's dive in. Mark chapter 8, verse 1. In those days, there was again a large crowd, and they had nothing to eat. So we've got 16,000 people, and they're in this tight group, and they've got nothing to eat. 16,000 people could be a little scary if they're not hungry, but they have no food and they are hungry. So listen to what Jesus says. He called the disciples and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they've already stayed with me three days and have nothing to eat. These people have been with Jesus for three days. That's a long time to be following someone. And Jesus feels for them. He says, I have compassion on the crowd. And that's this compassion that we've been talking about, this gut-wrenching feeling that compels you to action. They've been with me three days, and now they're hungry, and there's no food left. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way, and some of them have come a long distance. There's no food, and we are in the middle of Kansas. Have you driven through Kansas before? You can't just pull off the exit and stop at the drive through because if there is an exit, there's probably not food. And they're walking, they're not driving. But I also wanna be clear about what's not happening here. The people are not like, oh hey, we followed Jesus and we forgot to pack lunch. No, they're not taking a license when they follow Jesus saying, it's okay if we're not prepared. They've followed him for three days. I'm choosing to believe they brought some food with them and they've just run out. They followed him a little further than they thought they would. But they keep following. And Jesus has compassion on the crowd because they followed him this long and they have nothing left. And what he's about to do, what Jesus is about to do is not part of some PR stunt. He's not leading them into the desert to save 16,000 people from their hunger. They have followed him into the desert. And because he cares deeply, He's going to perform a miracle. His disciples answered him, where can anyone get enough bread in this desolate place to feed these people? Have you been there before? Where can anyone get enough to meet the need that exists here? Like maybe it was on a mission trip and you came across a need much greater than what you had brought supplies for. Who can get enough to provide for this? And Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? Now, some of you prefer to listen to your Bible. And it was funny if you listened to this chapter. Jesus is thinking, I just fed 5,000 people a couple of chapters ago with next to nothing. Here we are in the same situation. And so the narrator, when you listen, says, how many loaves do you have? Seven, they said. He commanded the crowd to sit down on the ground. Taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. So they served them to the crowd. They also had a few small fish, and after he blessed them, he said these were to be served as well. I always try to imagine, like, how is this piece of the story working? Is he breaking the bread, and it's just now he's got two pieces of bread? What's going on here? And then what about the fish? This is, John MacArthur said, these newly created dead fish are edible. So this is the only time in history that we know of fish being created dead and being edible. And we're talking about the creator of the universe making these fish. He probably knows how to make some good fish. They, this might be the best meal they've ever had. And they ate and were satisfied. Then they collected seven large baskets of leftover pieces. About 4,000 were there. He dismissed them, and he immediately got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. They ate and were satisfied. 
They didn't all get one bite of bread and long for more. He didn't break the seven loaves into 4,000 equal pieces. He fed the people and they were satisfied. 4,000 were there. Wait, Matt, didn't you say that there were 16,000 people? And because of the cultural context of this time, 4,000 men were likely there. So it's not counting women and children. Some scholars estimate that as many as 15 or more thousand were there, depending on how many kids each family had. So you could conservatively say at least 12,000, you know, a man, his wife, his child. The exact number isn't as important though, as he fed thousands upon thousands of people and they ate and were satisfied and there were seven baskets of leftover. So now the people are fed, Jesus can send them home and he goes to the next town. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, demanding of him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation demand a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. Then he left them, got back into the boat and went to the other side. So Jesus comes to the next town and the Pharisees are there and they want a sign and sighing deeply in his spirit. Do you ever sigh? Like parents, do you ever sigh at your kids? Amy and I, we've become parents in the last seven months, and so we don't have a whole lot to sigh about at this point. But when you're changing the 15th diaper today, or what feels like the 15th diaper today, you might let out a little sigh. And Claire, our daughter, thinks that's the funniest thing you can do. So it's become more of a game for us. What was one real sigh of has become <gasps> and she just cracks up. But I have to believe that when Jesus sighs here, he's not thinking that way. He's thinking, I just fed 16,000 people. What more sign could you ask for? And it's this frustration where he's fulfilling his mission and people are still not satisfied. So he says, nope, no sign. He gets back in the boat and leaves. In verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to take bread and had only one loaf with them in the boat. Mark is setting the stage here. He's letting us know there's only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. And that's really interesting because how many baskets of leftover pieces did they just pick up? Seven. And we're not talking about bread baskets that you get at Olive Garden. We're talking about giant bread baskets that you could fit a whole person into. It's that same Greek word when Paul's friends lower him out of the city, he's lowered in this kind of basket. That's a lot of bread, but they've only got one loaf with them in the boat. And so the story goes on and we're gonna need to know that there's one loaf in just a minute. Then he, Jesus, gave strict orders. Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Most of the story is pretty straightforward, but what are we talking about when we talk about the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod? And for us today, we typically associate leaven with yeast. In fact, I've got a jar of yeast right here. So you use it to make bread dough, pizza dough is what we like to make. You might use baking soda in a cookie recipe. But Merriam-Webster defines leaven in two ways. The first being yeast to make dough to cause it to rise. The second is something that modifies or lightens. Okay, so the yeast of Pharisees, the yeast of Herod. And I think the best way that we can understand what this means is that the Pharisees and Herod were trying to modify the law. In fact, they were making it stricter. They were so concerned with not breaking it that they would put a fence around it just to keep them from breaking it. So God gave the law. And one of the major themes that you see there is that the people are to be clean. So the Pharisees put a fence around that law. And if you look back just one chapter, at Mark 7, starting in verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him. They observed that some of the, his disciples were eating bread with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, keeping the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they have washed, 
And there are many other customs they have received and keep, like the washing of cups, pitchers, kettles, and dining couches. God says people are supposed to be clean, so the Pharisees say, all right, let's put up a fence. Everybody's gonna be clean. Before we eat, we're gonna wash our hands and do the dishes. I wanna be clear, it is good to wash your hands and do the dishes before you eat. But Jesus is correcting the teaching of the Pharisees here because they think that it's what goes into the body that makes somebody clean or unclean. But he says, it's what comes out of the body that reflects the heart that makes a person unclean. Jesus says your fence was pointless because that's not what God was talking about. And so Jesus is warning that they have to be weary of this kind of teaching. But the disciples didn't understand that. It went straight over their heads. Because remember when I said there was only one loaf of bread in the boat? Here we go. They were discussing among themselves that they had, they did not have any bread. Okay, guys, whose turn was it to get bread? It wasn't my turn. Oh, yeah, hey, I was supposed to get bread, but I kind of got distracted. Well, now what are we going to do? Jesus wants to eat. And aware of this, he said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Don't you understand or comprehend? Don't you have, or do you have hardened hearts? Do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of leftover pieces did you collect? 12, they told him. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you collect? Seven, they said. There are a couple of interesting pieces of information tucked away in here. Jesus says, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets were left over? 12. And when he broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, there were seven baskets left over. And when he fed the 5,000, he was on the Jewish side of the lake. And when he fed the 4,000, he was on the Gentile side of the lake. In the Bible, 12 typically represents the nation of Israel, the Jews, who were composed of 12 tribes. In seven, it typically represents a wholeness or a completion, but there are also seven major Gentile churches in the book of Revelation that we read about. So on the Jewish side of the lake, Jesus is enough and more than enough for the people. And then on the Gentile side of the lake, he was enough and more than enough for the people. Now there are 12 disciples in the boat with Jesus and they have one loaf of bread. And Jesus says, don't you understand yet? Earlier I told you that Amy and I had become parents and it's one of the most amazing things. So Claire's been learning to communicate and she's obviously too young to talk, but babies, they cry, they coo, they make all sorts of sounds. And in part of this learning to communicate, she's been learning that volume plays a major role in conversation. When she wants to grab our attention, she gets loud. Has God ever gotten loud with you? As I was reading this text, as I was studying this text, he got loud with me. When Jesus said, don't you understand yet, he's pleading with us to realize that what he's saying is, I'm enough for you. Jesus is enough for me and he is enough for you. Jesus crossed the dividing lines. He was enough for the Jews on the one side of the lake and he was enough for the Gentiles on the other side. If in his day he could cross the divide so great and be enough and more than enough for those on either side of the line, you better believe that today he is enough for you and he's enough for me. So what do we do? with this fact, Jesus is enough. And we're gonna get real here because there's a lot of ways that you could take this wrongly. So if you leave here today and you do the wrong thing with this, it will not be because I misinformed you. Jesus is enough for you and he is enough for me. And Jesus is enough for that person that you thought he could never be enough for. The Jews absolutely despise the Gentiles but Jesus declares he is enough. People today, they'll say, you are enough for you. Matt, you are enough. 
Can I tell you what a lie that is? I am not enough. You are not enough. Jesus and Jesus alone is enough. But you and I, we can't simply go about our lives and supposedly hold to this truth that Jesus is enough and let it do nothing to change us. There are ramifications for what this looks like in our life. There are things that you need to change in your life before you leave this room today and after you leave this room today. When we find out in the next couple of days or weeks that another life has been lost to racial injustice, and you go and talk to one of your friends at work or at school, and you say, well, my pastor told me Jesus is enough, so he must be enough. How do you think that conversation's gonna go? Not well, I hope. Because how does Jesus show that he's enough? He didn't say it. When we're reading the passage here, Jesus doesn't say, I'm enough, go in peace. No, he meets needs in the desert. The people are in desperate need of food. They cannot make it home. So he doesn't say, I'm enough, and send them off to pass out on the way. He declares through action, I am enough. How do you live that out in an injustice situation? Especially here where we're relatively removed from a lot of that tension that exists. How can I live so that people in these racial injustice situations know that Jesus is enough? And first, we must always stand for justice. The Bible says do justice. Those who are protesting police brutality and racial injustice are seeking justice. And I realize that there are some out there who are seeking violence and vengeance, that's not what we're talking about. And I realize that there are organizations that appear to have an agenda and their real agenda is different. That's not what we're talking about. We must stand for justice. Second, by standing for justice with those who are experiencing injustice, we are given an opportunity to speak life into their hurt. We have been part of meeting a physical need, in this case, justice in their life, that opens up an opportunity for us to share with them the good news of Jesus. And in this process of talking and sharing and walking out life together, there's the possibility that they realize Jesus is enough for you. Maybe he's enough for me. This world's full of evil and will never be perfect, but in the midst of everything going on, Jesus satisfies. And Jeff has mentioned a new ministry we've started in a couple of the places where we live, and we're feeding people on a weekly basis and connecting with them. And some of them, they really do need to be fed. For whatever reason, they don't have food at home or a lot of food at home. We're not trying to figure out why they don't have food at home before we give them food here. We just are trying to bless them. It's one less meal each week that they have to worry about. And then they can just come and connect with people, have a conversation. And as we meet needs through serving food and having those conversations, having those connections, we're able to declare that Jesus is enough. We as a church, are, we work with an organization called Project Nick. And yesterday, many of us ran or walked, I walked, to raise money for Project Nick. Because Project Nick exists to provide people with the opportunity to live out the love and justice of Jesus to the world. And as the love and justice of Jesus is being lived out by bringing children into a shelter, giving them food, giving them medicine, providing education, and sharing the gospel with them, Jesus becomes enough for them through his church. But I'm also going to realize that There are some of you here in this room and you're struggling with the question, is Jesus enough? Do I trust Jesus to be enough in my situation? Maybe you lost your job. How are you going to provide for your family? How are you gonna keep a roof over your head? How could I say that in your situation, Jesus is enough? And if that's you today, I want you to look around this room because God has provided for you a church family that you belong to. And we are here to walk this out with you. 
And I'm not talking about some sort of prosperity gospel. I'm talking about the fact that Jesus has been received in lives and he is, his good news is being poured out that there are people who can give and so they do to meet need. And as we walk this out, as we go through life together, you're going to see that Jesus is enough. You're going to see that in the midst of whatever is going on in your life, Jesus is enough. Or maybe you lost a close family member or a child. Matt, you don't understand. I don't. I don't understand. I've lost people before, but I will never understand the relationship that you had with the one that you loved and lost. But I know because God has told us in his word that Jesus suffers with us. He comforts us. And we as your church family are here to walk that out with you. We are here to help comfort so that you will realize that he has provided enough for you. He will satisfy that deep longing that exists in your life. One more. How do you sing praises when Jesus is enough? When we sang before this message, did you sing knowing that Jesus is enough? Because when we know that Jesus is enough, our hearts should come alive and there should be an audible, visible response to how great is our God. So we're gonna sing one more time and I want you to sing knowing that Jesus is more than enough. But if you don't know this Jesus that we're talking about today, I'm going to encourage you to find someone along the edge of the room or during the last song, um, or even after the service. If you're joining us online, you can send us a message through whatever platform you're using. And we wanna talk with you. We wanna pray with you if you'll let us. We want you to know that God so loved you that even though we are all sinners, he made a way for us to be right with him through Jesus. Because Jesus came and he lived the life we could never live. He died the death that we deserve. And then on the third day, he rose victorious over sin and death. We only have to turn to him and ask. And he will come and change our lives and our eternity. Jesus is enough for you. And he will satisfy like nothing else in this world. Would you pray with me? God, we can't keep going if you're not enough. But we know from your word this morning that you, you are enough. God, help us to live that out. We all have neighbors, we all have coworkers, friends who need to know that you are enough. God, don't let us leave here until we are committed to the change that you will bring in us. God, help us to know that you are more than enough, more than all we want, more than all we need, you are enough. In Jesus' name, amen. All of you, is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all i have in you is more than enough
sacrifice of greatest price still more awesome than I know you're my coming king you are everything still more awesome than I know all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have you more than all I want more than all I need you are more than Be seated, Vaughn, if you will. He is more than enough. Amen. Let me share with you a few things. This coming Saturday, the women's ministry is uh, sponsoring a clothes closet that's going to be held here at the Garden City campus. So uh, the, the clothing will be free, so you could spread that word. Anyone can come and find some clothes. I know there's... I saw a whole bunch of it this morning when I came in, so it's going to, I think, be a, 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 a plenty for anybody and everybody. So that is this coming Saturday, the 26th, here at the Garden City campus, the clothes closet. Also, next Sunday evening, September 27th, there will be a bonfire for young adults, that's uh, high school grads through 20-somethings, at the Norris Home in Harrisonville. So to find out a little more about that, you can go to the Ice Center, get the times and all of that, and uh, the uh, address. So uh, encourage you to be, be a part of that. So remember the bottom line today, if your child has been in uh, child care, friends encourage one another is the bottom line. So you can ask your kids, when has someone encouraged you? So uh, I didn't see too many no-K shirts today, but I saw two or three. Somebody said, well, they would be ashamed to wear a no-K shirt. I'm not. I wore mine. It's not what I could do. Listen, I went over that course. I did the whole thing. Of course, I was on a four-wheeler, but uh, <laughs> I wasn't able to run it or walk it, but I was able to help Project Nick by buying a no okay shirt. So it's not what I could do. It's what that represented. It. And there was over 100 people out there, I think almost 200 people, doing the, uh, the run and the walk and the no K okay either. So the bottom line is... A bunch of kids are going to be blessed. That was a wonderful thing, and it went really well. Well, we got the word today. As Matt left it with us, don't forget, Jesus is enough. And if you'd like to talk about it a moment, we'll kind of hang around here, come to the cross. Jesus is enough because of the cross. So we'll be over there for a few minutes if you'd like to talk about that.
God bless you. Have a great week, and uh, see you next Sunday.